Good morning and welcome to the class on the neurobiology of dopamine, GABA, serotonin, and acetylcholine. Sadly enough, this is one of my favorite topics, so hopefully you'll enjoy the hour as much as I will. Over the next hour, we're going to define neurobiology. And for the following neurotransmitters, we will look um, at their mechanism of action, their purpose, what they do in the brain and the, in the body, where they're found, because not all of them are found just in the brain, symptoms of excess and insufficiency. We'll also talk about nutritional building blocks that our clients need to be ingesting so their bodies can make these neurotransmitters, and medications that are commonly used to affect these neurotransmitters. So what is neurobiology? Basically, it's the study of the brain and the nervous system, which generates sensation, perception, movement, learning, emotion, and many of the functions that make us human. As we talk about these few neurotransmitters, and there's a bunch more, but we're just talking about a select few today, you will figure out that they are involved in all of these things. So it's not just mood. These um, neurotransmitters are involved in pain reception, movement, motivation, learning, ability to focus attention. Um, one of the things I want you to think about as we're talking is I want you to think about your patients because too often we think, okay, somebody's depressed, it must be a serotonin deficiency. And that's not always the case. Um, a lot of these uh, neurotransmitters, when they are out of balance, either too much or too little, will create uh, mood-related disorders and symptoms that mimic depression and anxiety. It's really important that we stress to our clients, um, especially if they're just starting to take medications, that it's an imperfect science. And sometimes we need to take a look at what's going on with them. Their symptoms will try something. If it has no effect, then we may try something completely different. Um, and it's important for them to communicate with their physicians or their prescribing physician. Um, I've always had the luxury of working in a clinic where we had an attending um, and we would have case conferences with the physician and the client. So it was a great multidisciplinary team. Um, not everybody has that luxury. But it is important for clients to be able to communicate what their symptoms are and advocate for themselves. So dopamine, we're going to start out with the big one. Dopamine is the one that we really talk about in terms of reward and motivation. It's our pleasure chemical. But it is responsible for movement, memory, pleasurable reward, behavior and cognition, attention, inhibition of prolactin production, sleep, mood, and learning. So how can dopamine be involved in all that? Well, you know, obviously there are a lot of complex mechanisms, but dopamine, remember I've said previously that we do things that are rewarding and we don't do things that are punishing or not rewarding. So dopamine is responsible for saying, yes, let's do that again. Yes, let's focus on this. Yes, let's pay attention here. Yes, let's focus here. Um, so when somebody is doing something that is positive for them or seems to be positive for them, uh, the dopamine will reinforce that behavior and say, let's do that again. So dopamine is responsible for um, our eating behaviors. When we eat, a little bit of dopamine is released. Not a lot. We're not talking like a cocaine response. We're talking just a little bit, enough to say, mm, this is pretty good. So let's go on and look at this a little bit further. Altered dopamine neurotransmission is implicated in cognitive control. So somebody has racing thoughts, has difficulty focusing, has difficulty paying attention, impulse control, and difficulty with their working memory. So basically, a lot of the symptoms of ADHD. Um, we want to look at what's going on with the dopamine system there. And I say altered because it can be too much or too little. The brain wants to keep a balance of these, all of these neurotransmitters. They work in concert. So if you have too much or too little, it's going to exacerbate or inhibit some of the others. That'll be clear, clearer as we talk. So where do we find dopamine? You know, we don't want to have racing thoughts. We don't want to have attention problems. We want to be motivated. We want to learn. We want to sleep. So where do we find this, and how do we make sure it's at its optimal levels? Ideally, the person, the body, 
is able to create enough dopamine to maintain its natural optimal level. Now, that can be disrupted when somebody's been um, basically abusing the dopamine system through addictive behaviors, and it is sometimes just a biological in insufficiency. But for the majority of people out there, the body can maintain its proper level of dopamine if it has proper nutrition, proper rest, um, and the motivation is there. So the precursor is L-DOPA, which is synthesized in the brain and kidneys. Dopamine functions in several parts of the peripheral nervous system, so this is things other than the brain. In blood vessels, it inhibits norepinephrine release and acts as a vasodilator. It causes relaxation. Norepinephrine is one of your stimulant chemicals, so dopamine comes in there and goes, chill, just chill. In the kidneys, it increases sodium and urine excretion. Okay, this is important because the kidneys help balance that sodium-potassium um, levels in the body. So if it's increasing the sodium and urine excretion, then the person can get dehydrated, which can lead to feelings of um, depression. If the sodium and potassium levels get out of balance, they can have irregular heartbeats, tachycardia, things like that. So it's important to remember too much dopamine can cause problems. When we have patients who are abusing drugs that greatly increase dopamine, guess what? Their urine excretion is probably going to be a lot higher and their electrolytes are probably going to be out of balance, which sets them up to be at higher risk for cardi cardiac problems, sets them up to be at higher risk for panic attacks and things like that. In the pancreas, dopamine reduces insulin production. Okay, now think. We have a client who is abusing the dopamine system. Maybe they are porn addicted. Okay, we're not even talking cocaine here. We're talking porn addiction. And they are getting that dopamine rush eh, 10, 15, 20 times a day. So they're getting more dopamine than their brain is really meant to handle. They're overloading that. So the pancreas may reduce insulin production um, as a result of, you know, having too much dopamine in the system. Now, eventually, the brain's going to cut it back and say, all right, that's not the amount we're supposed to have. But if you've got a patient who's diabetic, you can see where addictive behaviors can exacerbate the diabetic symptomatology. In the digestive system, it reduces gastrointestinal motility and protects the intestinal mucosa, which is a fancy way for saying it keeps your belly happy. Again, if you've got somebody who is flooding their system with dopamine, they may find that they don't have a lot of gastrointestinal motility and they may have some digestive problems. In the immune system, it reduces lymphocyte activity, tells the immune system to kind of chill out, which potentially, now they, I don't know of any studies that have done this, but you can extrapolate that if you're reducing the lymphocyte activity, if re you're reducing those white blood cells from doing their job, your immune system could go down. So all of these things are reasons we want to protect this dopamine system, aside from the fact that when it's either um, has insufficient dopamine or not enough is getting to um, the receiving neurons, that we start feeling depressed and lack motivation. You know, dopamine's a biggie. We want to cherish this. Symptoms of excess and insufficiency. Excess dopamine. Unnecessary movements and repetitive tics. Psychosis. Hypersexuality. Nausea. Most antipsychotic drugs are dopamine antagonists. So if you have a client who is experiencing psychotic symptoms, one of the first things you're going to probably see the psychiatrist do is put them on an antipsychotic or an atypical antipsychotic. These are probably dopamine antagonists. They're probably there to reduce the amount of dopamine, which, you know, in theory, you're going, okay, cool. It fixes them. Not exactly. Uh, we also see in people with bipolar disorder, which is why a lot of the atypical antipsychotics also are effective um, with people with bipolar disorder, um, the hypersexuality. And sometimes in a manic episode, there are some psychotic symptoms. So dopamine can be involved in a lot of different diagnoses. 
Dopamine antagonists are some of the most effective anti-nausea agents. Okay, great. Why do we care? Well, if you've got somebody who's on um, a dopamine antagonist, an antipsychotic drug, and they're also taking anti-nausea, they're basically kind of doubling up on their meds. One of the things that I've seen a lot over the many, many years is that patients don't effectively communicate with their doctors what medications they're taking. So you may have a patient seeing a psychiatrist and getting an antipsychotic, um, and you may have them seeing a, their general physician and getting an anti-nausea agent, and neither, both doctors are prescribing antagonists, dopamine antagonists, but guess what? Neither one of them knows about the other. So this person is actually getting too much um, of the dopamine antagonism. Insufficient dopamine. Negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And, you know, just to kind of review uh, Psych 101, neg negative symptoms are the things that we see in patients with schizophrenia that should they should be there. They don't want to talk. Um, they are catatonic, um, cognitive deficits. So insufficient dopamine may lead to some of the negative um, symptoms of schizophrenia, which means we want to crank up the dopamine. So wait a minute. We have somebody with schizophrenia and we're prescribing antipsychotics or anti um, uh, bab antipsychotic drugs, dopamine antagonists, that's the word I'm looking for, they're being prescribed an antagonist, but then they also have the negative symptoms. And so do we prescribe an agonist? So they're taking an agonist and an antagonist. It seems like it would cancel out, which it actually does usually. Um, insufficient dopamine is also implicated in a, a more acute sense of pain, Parkinson's disease, restless leg syndrome, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, I had a client who uh, had restless, leg, restless legs syndrome um, and was being prescribed medication for that to increase her dopamine, but she was also displaying psychotic symptoms and symptoms of schizophrenia, so the psychiatrist was prescribing her, you guessed it, dopamine antagonists. So she was taking medications that were basically working against each other. Um, neurological symptoms that increase in frequency with age, such as decreased arm swing and increased muscle rigidity and age-related changes in cognitive flexibility um, that we see in people as just a normal matter of course can be, the be because of the reduction of the dopamine receptors. Does that mean they all need to be medicated? No. Um, but we do need to be more attentive to it and realize that dopamine may be implicated and, you know, at some point they may need medication. Insufficient dopamine has also been implicated, and these will sound familiar to you, in lack of motivation, fatigue, inabil inability to feel pleasure, sleep problems, sense of hopelessness, Difficulty concentrating. Sound like the symptoms of depression? Yeah, it certainly does. Um, so when we hear these symptoms, we don't want to automatically say it's this. It could be hypothyroid. It could be a dopamine imbalance. It could be a serotonin imbalance. It could be a host of things. So we need to not just jump um, at, at the first sign of depressive symptoms and go, oh, I know what's causing this. Because we really don't. We're, we're inaccurate at best. We found that there is a, about 40% of people, um, according to a recent Yale study, about 40% of people with depression, major clinical depression, that do not respond to SSRIs. Why is that? Because it's not working on the right serotonin uh, receptors? Probably not. It's probably because their depressive symptoms are being caused by an imbalance in a different neurotransmitter. They're hypothesizing at this point dopamine or norepinephrine. But 
the link to that article is at the end of this presentation if you want to go read read up on it it's actually a really well written article nutritional building blocks for dopamine now the cool thing is with nutritional building blocks as opposed to taking mega supplements or medications uh, the body's going to use what it needs and it's going to you know excrete the rest so if we can encourage people to eat a healthy diet the chances of them grossly throwing one neurotransmitter system or one system out of whack is highly unlikely they're not going to eat you know four cups of turmeric or five watermelons in a day um, i don't even know if that would be enough but eating a diet high in magnesium and tyrosine and again the tendency for a lot of our, our patients is to go oh high magnesium well let me go od on magnesium supplements and that's just dangerous in so many different ways um, they want to eat a diet high in magnesium and tyrosine rich foods to provide the basic building blocks the other thing to educate your patients about and you know we can't usually uh, in most states i think all but most states at least we can't prescribe nutritional guidelines that's something for a physician or a registered dietitian but we can't educate our patients that the way foods occur in nature actually make them more available to our body so if you eat if you just take a magnesium supplement it may not be taken in but as as well by the body as eating foods that are high in magnesium which are also high in other vitamins that make it more bioavailable um, list of foods known to increase dopamine a lot of these are very palatable foods chicken almonds apples bananas bananas and chicken and almonds are actually three big ones that are common among all the neurotransmitters but green leafy vegetables too two of my favorites chocolate and green tea lima beans oatmeal wheat germ sesame and pumpkin seeds turmeric and watermelon um, I think I read those off in order of my preferences but <laughs> you can see that it, regardless of what whether your patient is a um, vegan a vegetarian an omnivore whatever they can probably find some foods in this list that are supportive of um, healthy brain chemistry encourage them before they start making major changes in their diet you know legal caveat here encourage them to talk with their doctor and or a nutritionist first medications dopamine in the blood is unable to cross the blood brain barrier to reach the brain so we can't just give somebody dopamine and go voila you're gonna have more dopamine and be better uh, what they do is they give a combination of levodopa and carbidopa which actually the carbidopa pre prevents the levodopa from breaking down in the bloodstream before it gets to the brain so it's more available once it gets to the brain so in order to increase dopamine we've got the levodopa carbidopa combination and it's actually kind of fun to say but anyway <laughs> i digress um when we start looking at the dopamine antagonists we've got risperdone haldol and zyprexa a lot of others too but these are the ones that in my practice i most commonly see um, you can go to uh, i think it's drugs.com and you can find a list of all the common dopamine antagonists uh, metoclopramide or reglin is an antiemetic and an antipsychotic it's given i know my son was actually given it when he was discharged from the nicu because it helped with stomach emptying had i realized at that point <laughs> that it acted on the dopamine system i probably would have been much more resistant to giving it to him um you know live and learn but some of our patients may be experiencing especially if they've got gastric reflux or something um, may have this medication so if they're taking reglan in addition to risperdone haldol zyprexa um not all of those obviously any of those uh, again they may be doubling up likewise if you have a client who's taking an antagonist but also has parkinson's symptoms or restless legs and they're taking something like mirapex or requip uh, 
Um, and yes, I'm using the trade names just because that's what we usually recognize more easily. And I'm not recommending um, or showing favoritism towards any of these. They're just the ones that I see more often in practice. Um, you know, you can see if they're taking one of those drugs plus an antagonist, they may be kind of working against each other. Patients with schizophrenia, let's talk about the dopamine hypothesis that said dopamine imbalance causes schizophrenia. <laughs> Not so much. We're figuring out that that was wrong, or at least a very crude um, hypothesis. Patients with schizophrenia don't typically show measurably increased levels of brain dopamine activity. Okay, so they don't have too much by measure, and they also don't have too little by measure. It's, it's give or take within average, so we don't know exactly. Um, additionally, other dissociative drugs such as ketamine and phencyclidine that act on your glutamate receptors, we're going to talk about that when we get down to GABA, um, can also produce psychotic symptoms. So if there are other receptors that produce psychotic symptoms, we don't necessarily know that every patient that presents with psychotic symptoms has a dopamine imbalance. It could be a dopamine, it could be a, an imbalance in glutamate or other receptors that we haven't identified yet. So those drugs that do reduce dopamine activity are a very imperfect treatment for schizophrenia. Not only do they only reduce the positive symptoms, um, they also may produce severe short and long-term effects. So we're just going to jump from that to GABA. Dopamine is our pleasure chemical. It's our reward chemical. GABA is our relaxation chemical, if we want to just kind of use a gross overview. It's generally used for anti-anxiety and anti-convulsant purposes. The interesting thing with GABA is that it's made from glutamate. So GABA functions as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, where glutamate, the precursor to GABA, is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So you need glutamate in order to form GABA, but they actually have opposite effects. Close to 40% of the synapses in the human brain work with GABA and therefore have GABA receptors. So we can see that for whatever reason, and I'm sure we haven't identified all of them yet, GABA is a really important neurotransmitter. Symptoms of excess. Excessive sleepiness, shallow breathing, basically, basically getting way too relaxed, um, and, and symptoms of, of uh, CNS depression. The interesting thing with GABA is that you have sort of a protective effect. If you get way too much, the blood pressure may go back up in order to try to self-protect. Um, sy symptoms of insufficiency, anxiety, depression, difficulty concentrating, ins insomnia, and sometimes seizure disorders. Nutritional building blocks. Fermented foods like sauerkraut and yogurt. Almonds again. Cherry tomatoes. Bananas again. Oats again. Um, lentils, brown rice, potatoes. Vitamin B6 is also important um, in the production of GABA. So, Making sure that your clients are getting, you know, the, their servings of grains, where they're going to get their B vitamins from, is going to be important. Um, encourage them to educate themselves about what they're eating, at the very least. Inositol is also a nutrient that is found in wheat germ, brown rice, green leafy vegetables, nuts, and beans. Same kind of list again. Uh, that is important in enabling the body to use GABA. So we want to make sure they're getting those, I don't want to say carbohydrates because there's carbohydrates in everything. We want to make sure they're getting their grains, their nuts, and their grains. Medications, drugs that act as allosteric modulators of GABA receptors um, or GABAergic drugs increase the available amount of GABA and typically have a relaxing anti-anxiety and anti-convulsive effect. So you probably have worked with a client who's been on Neurontin or Gabapentin. 
um, it's a GABA analog used to treat epilepsy and um, pain, especially with fibromyalgia. And um, I have a, one client who had a double mastectomy, and she still has some neurologic pain. And uh, gabapentin has helped her with that. Your benzos and your barbiturates, including GHB, uh, also can be used as GABAergic drugs. Serotonin, mechanisms of purpose. This is another one like dopamine that just does so many things. And too much or too little um, can be bad. Both, both cases, bad. It helps regulate mood your sleep patterns, appetite, and pain. Uh, we'll get to mood in a second, but one of the interesting things to understand about uh, sleep patterns is melatonin comes from serotonin. Um, melatonin helps us sleep and relax at night. So if somebody is deficient in serotonin, guess what? Um, where is it found? It's found in the brain, but interestingly, the majority of your serotonin is found in your gut and in your intestines. So, what does that say for people who have irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, yada, yada, yada? Uh, how does that impact, impact their serotonin availability? I'm just postulating there. You can chew on that and <laughs> think about it. Symptoms of excess serotonin. Now, I'm not talking serotonin syndrome, which is a life-threatening uh, situation. If somebody is showing um, severe shivering, diarrhea, muscle rigidity, fever, seizures, and irregular heartbeat, it is a medical emergency. They need to get to the doctor, to the hospital right now. We're not going to the average doctor. Um, Serotonin syndrome can be brought on by people taking multiple SSRIs or sometimes um, the combination of certain other drugs. And again, drugs.com is great because it's got an um, interactions checker. You can put in the patient's medications and then you can run a check. And it tells you which ones have been known to cause problems together. Does it mean they're never prescribed together? No. Um, but it means there have been some negative reactions. If you have a patient who is just starting to take um, SSRIs, they may experience one or two mild symptoms. Generally, diarrhea is a big um, complaint when people start taking serotonin and kind of feeling lightheaded. That's the serotonin, the SSRI kind of getting into the into the system um, but muscle rigidity fevers with uh, serotonin syndrome the fever will go like way high like cook you from the inside high so it's important again to get people to the doctor oh the other thing that can cause it is people are taking over-the-counter supplements that increase serotonin like SAMI or um, 5-HTP so if you've got them taking that plus SSRIs, they're setting themselves up for potentially a physical crisis. Other symptoms of excess, depression, apathy, emotional flatness, passivity, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, poor memory, difficulty making decisions and acting on them, and sexual dysfunction. And you're saying to yourself, er, that's the symptom of insufficiency. Well, yeah. Interestingly, too little or too much can basically produce very similar symptoms. One difference is when there is uh, too much serotonin, we tend to find that that person is a lot more anxious. They t tend to be a, lo a lot more high strung, a lot more amped up. Does that always mean if somebody is depressed and anxious at the same time that they've got too much serotonin? No, it doesn't. We can't ever say anything is always with a person. But we can say that we need to look at whether, a, whether increasing their serotonin is probably the best step and talk with them more about their symptoms, how they came on, um, family history, those sorts of things. Insufficiency, depression, anxiety, and pain sensitivity. 
people with low serotonin have a higher pain sensitivity or a lower pain tolerance in general. We want to look at our patients who are in methadone clinics. Um, as they are detoxing off of the methadone, we want to look and say, okay, well, you know, they're not producing the endogenous opioids right now. We know that. Uh, but is their serotonin system also wonky as they're detoxing? Because, you know, the detox from methadone, suboxone, or any of your opiates is unpleasant at best. Um, so other things may be getting out of whack, including their serotonin system, which in addition to not having their natural painkillers, if their serotonin is out of whack, they may be more sensitive to that pain. Something to consider, something to look at if you've got a patient who is at risk of relapse, um, who is detoxing from opioids, have them talk with their doctor. Nutritional building blocks. I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Whole wheat, potatoes, brown rice, lentils, oats, and beans. I told you it was a pretty short list that was just going to repeat, uh, which is good because you know what? A short list is easy for people to remember, and most, most people can find something on here that they like. Medications to adjust serotonin. Your SSRIs. Um, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors make sure that there's more serotonin in the synaptic space to get absorbed your snris also work selectively on some of your serotonin receptors snris is selective norepinephrine um, reuptake inhibitors uh, 5-htp i mentioned that earlier that is over-the-counter su supplement that is supposed to increase, and, you know, studies have shown it does increase levels of serotonin in certain people. Now, if they already have too much serotonin, whether, they're not, whether or not they're taking SSRIs, this could further influence or, or make their problem worse. Uh, I really discourage uh, my patients from just randomly taking supplements, especially ones that are purported to affect their mental health without talking to their doctor first and being medically supervised because it is so easy to create a situation that is where they bring on a, a uh, psychotic crisis or they bring on a physical crisis. And finally, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is one of those interesting ones that we don't talk about a lot. Um, in lower amounts, acetylcholine can act as a stimulant. It, it causes the body to release nor, norepinephrine and dopamine. So I'm thinking, ooh, I want more acetylcholine, so I get more dopamine. Doesn't exactly work that way, because remember I said it, they all work in concert and in balance. Acetylcholine is implicated in memory, motivation, higher order thought processes, sexual desire and activity, and sleep, just like all the others. Symptoms of excess, and I just shortened this because pretty much the entire DSM list of depressive symptoms was a symptom of excess acetylcholine. Nightmares, especially vivid ones, mental fatigue and fogginess and anxiety. So, remember we're talking about all this stuff as a symptom of excess serotonin can also be a symptom of excess acetylcholine. Ask your patients... You know, sometimes they're more willing to tell us than they are their, their medical doctors, um, which I wish wasn't the case. But ask them if they're taking any supplements. Because sometimes they'll say, yeah, I read online that this is supposed to help me with my anxiety or my depression or my motivation, my mental clarity. Make sure to make a note of those and make sure that their attending physician is aware of what they're taking. There is an inverse relationship between serotonin and acetylcholine. So as acetylcholine goes up, serotonin goes down. So if we're increasing, and let's go back here, if somebody's taking an SSRI and increasing their serotonin, then they're going to have lower acetylcholine. 
Now, if the increase in serotonin lowers the acetylcholine to the point where it's releasing a good amount of nor norepinephrine and dopamine, then we've reached that happy balance. But if the serotonin gets too high and the acetylcholine gets too low, then potentially we could have some suppression of norepinephrine and dopamine, which is not good. We like dopamine. And norepinephrine is actually one of our motivation chemicals, so we don't want to get rid of that either. Insufficiency of acetylcholine, Alzheimer's and dementia, Parkinson's symptoms, impaired cognition, attention, and arousal. Cholinergic and GABAergic pathways, so acetylcholine and GABA, are connected in the brain and are responsible for helping us remember things, think clearly, and be motivated and awake. So if one of those symptoms or one of those neurotransmitters is out of whack, we're going to have a problem. So this is acetylcholine and GABA. Nutritional building block. This is a little bit more open. Meats, dairy, pol poultry. I like the fact that chocolate keeps coming up, but we don't want to encourage our, our clients to go out and start binging on Reese's Cups. Um, when we're talking about chocolate, um, cocoa powder is a better substitute because it doesn't have all the fat in it. Um, I personally put cocoa powder in my coffee all the time, but <laughs> I'm sort of a chocolate fiend. Uh, Chocolate is not the best thing for people to use as a replacement because you have to eat so much of it to have any sort of notable impact. And nobody's going to eat half a cup of cocoa powder. And I'm talking the dark, unsweetened, unfattened cocoa powder. It's kind of bitter. But uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit can help. Peanut butter, wheat germ. Um, and Brussels sprouts and broccoli. And in response to a question, there are some blood tests to identify that have been used to identify um, neurotransmitter levels. So yes, there are some blood tests that have been used to identify that, but they are inefficient at best. Um, it's better if they can... Uh, talk with their doctor and be monitored very, very closely at the beginning. Um, getting a good uh, psychosocial history and getting a good history of the development of the disorder will probably give the doc a better idea of where to start with these patients. Um, so medications, cholinergics are used to treat glaucoma bladder control, and severe muscle weakness. Glaucoma is one we hear about, but not as much as all of the commercials that advertise the bladder control medications. So remember, cholinergics are going to increase the amount of acetylcholine that's available. Um, so going back here, if they already have too much, they may be having symptoms of depression, nightmares, mental fatigue, and anxiety. Combine that with medications meant to increase the acetylcholine, those symptoms may get worse. So medications that they're taking for disorders other than their mental health can have pretty significant mental health side effects that they just need to watch for. Anticholinergics may worsen things like gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, GERD, that sphincter that closes and keeps the stomach contents from coming back up, um, is weak. So if somebody's taking an anticholinergic, it may make that muscle not tighten quite as much. Um, anticholinergics are used for extrapyramidal symptoms um, in schizophrenia. So when you have a client who has restlessness, agitation, um, we will have um, occasionally clients who are taking um, antipsychotics or atypical antipsychotics, and they will be restless. They'll switch from one side of the seat to the other. They'll be jittery, agitated. Um, they may or may not have muscle spasms, may or may not have drug-induced Parkinsonism. Um, 
Um, and tardive dyskinesia, the involuntary muscle movements in the lower face um, and distal extremities, the ones that we always associate with high levels of antipsychotic medication with people smacking their lips, tongue movements, finger movements, those sorts of things. So all of these may be addressed with anticholinergics. Ah, but we're getting to the caveat here. Some of your anticholinergics are atropine, um, cogentin. I know I've worked with patients who've been on uh, cogentin before. Chlortrimeton. Ah, you know, that's one of those uh, antihistamines that we hear about. Thinking about that and patients who are taking over-the-counter medications, not even thinking that it will impact their um, prescription medications. Dimenhydramine or Dramamine. So if you've got somebody who's got, you know, I personally get, get movement sick pretty much everywhere. <laughs> I'm not the fun person to have in the car. But if somebody takes Dramamine, it may have some significant mood side effects. I know when I take Dramamine, I get really, really depressed. Not just lethargic, but um, again, I'm even less fun to be around than when I'm sick. <laughs> Diphenhydramine. If you look on the side of NyQuil, if you look on the side of any of your, quote, sleep medications like Somonex or Advil PM or Unisom, um, Benadryl PM, Tylenol PM, they have diphenhydramine in them. This is Benadryl. Benadryl is, is a mild anticholinergic. Um, hydroxyzine. I haven't seen Adorex, but I do see Visteril quite a bit. I do see Wellbutrin and Zyban quite a bit. Um, and Dextromethorphan. And I'm going to go off on a little tangent on dextrom Dextromethorphan right now. Um, because not only is it one of those drugs that's in most co cough preparations and most cold preparations that people use and it may be contraindicated with the meds they're on, but um, youth have figured out that you can take dextromethorphan rectally, and it is directly absorbed into the bloodstream a lot faster than orally, um, and it's got the anti, uh, anti, anticholinergic effects, gives them a buzz, so be aware, dextromethorphan is starting to become one of those that's abused. So think about if you've got a client, I mean, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to see clients that are on um, Zyban, they're, they've got a cold, they're taking dextromethorphan and diphenhydramine, and maybe they've also got um, allergies and they're taking chlortrimeton. So, you know, you can see where we're kind of doubling up here because you think Benadryl is an antihistamine, dextromethorphan is a cough suppressant, so they wouldn't work in concert or with one another when actually they kind of do. So encourage your clients to take it seriously when the docs say what over-the-counter medications and what supplements are you taking, um, because they can have a significant effect on prescription medications. Anticholinergic drugs are used to treat a variety of conditions from gastrointestinal disorders to genitourinary disorders and respiratory disorders. A lot of our clients have those being aware of what they're taking um, for these disorders and what they're taking for their mental health is important. I know I've beat that one into the ground at this point. So one last little thing on homeostasis, because you know that I totally love how the body tries to protect itself and maintain homeostasis. Um, higher acetylcholine and norepinephrine, so your ACH and NE, with low serotonin, so high acetylcholine, high norepinephrine, low serotonin produces anxiety, emotional lability, irritability, anger, aggressiveness, rumination, impatience, and impulsiveness. That describes most people I see. <laughs> it does not necessarily mean that they exclusively have um, a serotonin imbalance or this always describes them. But it's interesting to see what happens when you start changing the balance 
of these uh, neurotransmitters. When norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin are low, that's just bad, um, <laughs> and acetylcholine is high, the result is, for lack of a <coughs> better explanation, simply depression. And increasing serotonin lowers acetylcholine. We talked about that earlier. But it also lowers norepinephrine and dopamine. So as one increases, these other three go down, you're upsetting the apple truck, if you will. We need to make sure that things are in balance. It's important to remember that it's not necessarily always about increasing something. Too often as a society, our first thought is we don't have enough fill in the blank, so I need to get more fill in the blank. Sometimes it's that you got too much and it's causing everything else to be suppressed, which is why it's really helpful for patients to keep a food diary, chart out their moods, chart out what happens when they take their medications. Um, and we can make it pretty simple as clinicians. We can give them charts where they're just checking boxes so it's not taking, you know, 20 minutes four times a day. But it's really helpful to be able to look at patterns, um, see whether there are certain patterns that have to do, obviously, with work, with sleep time, with nutrition, um, with number of hours of daylight. Anything that might be impacting it, in addition to looking at how it came on and when they start taking a medication, what happens to their symptoms, both immediately and over four to six weeks. So there are a variety of different neurotransmitters involved in addiction and mental health disorders. It's not always about increasing a neurotransmitter. Sometimes you need to decrease it. The human brain tries to maintain homeostasis because too much or too little of anything can be bad, whether it's water or dopamine. Too much or too little can be bad. A balanced diet will provide the brain the necessary nutrients, nutrients in synergistic combinations that will help it have the building blocks it needs. And what it doesn't need, it'll just excrete. So there are several slides worth of um, resources that you can go back and look at if you have questions or if you're really interested in this. A couple of them that I, I found really interesting were on diet soda and aspartame con consumption. Um, looking at the inositol um, chemical, or not chemical, but nutrient, Biofactors, looking at GABA, and then that textbook I told you about that talked about neuro, neuropsychopharmacology. It is free. It is online. It is available. It is not the most exciting read in the world, but if you're fascinated by the way things work in the brain like I am, you might find it interesting reading, you know, when you're on the train on the way to work or whatever the case may be. So, um, in response to your question earlier about the blood tests, I will find the references that I was looking at when uh, I made this class, and I will message you with them um, in the next couple of hours so you have information on ways we can test and what we can and cannot do with as far as determining in a live patient their level of neurotransmitters. Any other questions? Okay. Um, let's see. I stopped the share. 